Thank you all for joining us here at I-80 Sports, where today we're talking about Tom Wilson, some playoff predictions, and other news and notes around the NHL. Thank you all for joining us here again at IAD Sports. Make sure you check out our website, IADsports.com, for all of your IAD Sports needs, for all of your coverage based on the NFL, MLS, and all of the other sports around the world. You got to make sure to check out IADsports.com. And while you're there, hit up the shop. Get all your IAD Sports needs while you're there. And make sure you hit us up on Twitter at I80 underscore sports NHL. The road to 1000 is still on and there's still time to hop on. If you're not currently following, make sure that you're following now because we have had quite the week in the NHL. And hey, while you're here on YouTube, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe for much more content. I'm Brian. He's Tom. Tom, I'm worried to ask, how are you doing? I'm in a bad mood. I'm in a bad, 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 and hey, we'll give it one more bad mood. That's a lot of bads. That's a lot of bads. And for right reason, because it has been a bad week for Rangers fans in general. But we're going to be unpacking that all as we go. But there's no avoiding it at this point. It's time to dive right in. There's a reason why I'm wearing this Washington Capitals jersey tonight. And no, it's not because of the person who is technically on the back of this jer- jersey, uh, Alexander Ovechkin. Uh, it's actually because of another player that currently plays for the Washington Capitals. And you may know his name. His name is Tom Wilson. And he got into quite the scuffle on Monday night, battling in front of the net. You know, hard battle with Pavel Buchnevich in front of the Rangers net. Pavel Buchnevich is down on the ground. Tom Wilson takes a uh, swipe with his glove right to the top, right to the back of his head, and s- sparks a scuffle. Rangers, uh, all on the ice, are quick to try to you know step up to Tom Wilson. And one of the people that tried to step up to Tom Wilson was tiny little five ten. You know, weighs maybe one hundred and eighty pounds wet. Artemi Panarin, the star golden boy for the New York Rangers, and he went down in a heap to the ice from Tom Wilson after he shoved him down after a brief scuffle, uh, leaving Artemi Panarin out for the remainder of the regular season, which, spoiler alert, there's only three games left in the regular season for the Rangers, but it left Rangers fans an outcry for Tom Wilson's suspension, maybe even banishment, according to other uh, outlets you know, just citing, for instance, uh, Boomer Esiason, who had called for it. And lo and behold, as consistent as George Paros, the head of the NHL's uh, disciplinary department has been all season. And as we've talked about, $5,000 fine, which is the maximum allowed amongst the CBA. And it has left the NHL world quite divisive on the topic. And we're going to unpack that right now. So, I will wait to hear Tom's thoughts on this. We actually haven't even gotten a chance to really talk about this in the past uh, days, in the past 48 hours in the aftermath of this. This happened on Monday. It's currently Wednesday. Tom, what are your reactions? What are your thoughts to this? Here, I was on mute. Sorry, guys. Sorry, everybody. Well, I mean, you got to look at it twofold. As far as our Teddy Panarin is concerned, and I just want to put this out there and people – are living in la-la land, don't want to believe this. Artemi Panarin was playing hurt the last, about the last few weeks, maybe even the last month. He looked off. He wasn't practicing. So him being out for three games and everyone thinking his career is over, it's not. He banged his shoulder pretty hard. Yeah, I don't think his shoulder separated. But the GM and the front office at the time, and we'll go into later about why, where they are right now, at the time just probably said, listen, it's precautionary. Why would we have him in game so he can hurt himself? Worse, we're not going to the playoffs. We have a plethora of kids we want to take a look at here. So listen, he got thrown down. He's been hurt. We're not going to use him. When it comes to Tom Wilson here, it's 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 just when does it stop? When does it stop? You know, I understand that he's like a good player. I understand he's not a total enforcer. There's no there's, there's no such thing as a total enforcer anymore. If you guys want to go back, I think maybe an episode or so, you heard me go on a whole rant about that. There's no say he can score goals. He's a good hockey player. He's a tough guy. He can play tough, he can score goals, he can agitate. Fine, but, you know, you don't punch somebody in the head when they're down on the ice. 
You just don't do it. I'm sorry. You just don't do it. There's no excuse for that. And, you know, a lot of people are calling him out. Freaking Matt Cook called him out. Matt Cook, who was in trouble all the time 10 years ago, and basically got to the point where the league told him, like, listen, if you don't tone it down, you're done. You're going home. You're not playing anymore, and we'll make sure of it. So uh, when does this stop? Paul Stewart. Paul Stewart, former referee, called him out the other day. He said the fine was a joke and that Colin Campbell does need to put his foot down. And the problem is, is that now with this, Depart this Department of Player Safety head, it's still in Colin Campbell's hand. Colin Campbell can veto anything he does. Before they had that, basically Colin Campbell made the call, and then maybe Brendan Shanahan made the call in that, in that situation. And then way, way back, Brian Burke made the call. It's, 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 I understand it was a scuffle. I understand it was a typical hockey scuffle. Should Panarin have jumped on his back if he knew he was? So Panarin was trying to save his team. Should Panarin have thought a little bit before he went and did something? Yeah. But something more should have been done about this. And maybe George Paros isn't the guy for this job. You know, I understand Paros was a goon, but, you know, Paros was college educated, Princeton graduate. I digress. But maybe, maybe they shouldn't be putting a former player in this role anymore. Maybe it should go back to a guy like Brian Burke, who was a well educated lawyer, who has no who has no bias towards this kind of player or that kind of player or this team or that team, maybe it's time you scrap this and you just put it back in the vice president's hands again. Because I'm sorry. Okay, should he have been suspended for life? No, I don't think so. Should he have been suspended for the rest of the season? I'm even going to say maybe not. But, you know, should he have sat maybe 10 games? Should he have sat into the playoffs? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, uh, this is kind of tough. The problem becomes – with George Paros and how he has been assessing discipline throughout this year in the NHL, he backed himself into a corner. This is something that we alluded to a couple weeks ago. And for those of you curious as to what episode we talked about that on, you can go find that on YouTube. So I'm going to let you guys do that. Circle your way back here and then come back here. But the problem is you had offenses earlier in the month with both Connor McDavid and Nathan McKinnon, both suspendable offenses as egregious. I feel as Tom Wilson, no suspension to either of them. NHL doesn't make money when Nathan McKinnon and Connor McDavid aren't on the ice. So the problem becomes now the Tom Wilson incident happens. Well, you didn't suspend Connor McDavid and Nathan McKinnon. Is it really right to suspend Tom Wilson here? All right, I guess it's not. My argument here is maybe Tom Wilson shouldn't have been suspended for this. If you really think about all of this, yes, was it bad what he did to Pavel Buchnevich? Yes. But that's not what everybody's actually up in arms about in this. For everybody I've talked to is more mad, especially in the media, is more mad about Artemi Panarin and have completely forgotten the Pavel Bucinavich play, which is the amazing. That's the part that blows my mind because the Artemi Panarin thing, that was nothing. That was a nothing thing. If you want to put blame on any play, anybody, put blame on the Rangers for not putting anybody on the ice to protect Artemi Panarin. You know, the Rangers did such a good job building this team, but you got rid of one of your only guys that can actually stand up and protect a guy like Artemi Panarin and, Bren, uh, and Brendan Lemieux. Yes, you have Brendan Smith. I I know, I know, I know, I know. I know I'm going to back myself into a corner on this one, but... Can I just say something real quick about that, though? Sure. How could you... Their first line was out there, you know? You can't... Their first line was out there. You can't just put Brendan Lemieux on the first line, you know, when you... I think it was on a power play. Well, I actually didn't see the game I was playing that night, but... Your first line's out there. You can't put a goon who can't skate on your first line anymore. It just doesn't work. Oh, I, I'm not arguing that whatsoever. I'm saying there are plenty of bigger guys that have the scoring upside like a Tom Wilson, like a Pat Maroon, that can still play up and be that Swiss Army knife and be able to step in when needed, I feel like. That being said, the bottom line to all of this is if this was anybody – except for Tom Wilson, nobody would be mad. If it was anybody else, if it was Evgeny Kuznetsov that did this, or if it was Alexander Ovechkin, or if it was Zdeno Chara, 
anybody else on the Washington Capitals that did this. None of what has unfolded in the past 48 hours would have happened at all. And this kind of goes to show that Tom Wilson lives rent free in a lot of GMs, coaches, and players heads. And it's a bad reputation that Tom Wilson has built for himself. It's also something that he has actively tried to work on this year up to this point. He played relatively clean up to this point. He had one or two questionable quote unquote plays once against the Boston Bruins. And I believe once I think maybe against the Philadelphia Flyers, I might be mistaken on that second team. He had one questionable incident this year that was not, you know, reviewable amongst the CBA or disciplinary reasons, but he'd been playing cleaner and he had actively said he had been trying his best to play a cleaner style of hockey. And up until Monday night, he had, and Monday night rolls around. He lost his composure, plain and simple. But if Tom Wilson plays for anybody else's team, they're not mad about this. You know, I unfortunately think this is going to cost George Paros his job, and I think it should because, yeah, I agree with you, Tom. Maybe it should have been a one or two game suspension for this just to get him off the ice for the game that we're currently watching tonight on Wednesday night, as we'll we'll talk about a little bit more later. But, man, just the fallout from this from the Rangers has been a fall from grace in many, many ways, unfortunately for the Rangers, but for Tom Wilson, yes. Should he have been suspended? Maybe suspended for the rest of the regular season. Those that are calling for him to be banned. That's clownish. You know, yes. The argument can be made. Well, this is how you eventually avoid a Todd Bertuzzi situation. This was nowhere close to a Todd Bertuzzi situation. We have seen far worse in the past 15 years. We have seen far worse situations in the past 15 years that have been met with swift suspensions. Rafi Torres is one of the people that can actively say, yeah, I stopped myself from killing somebody because I got suspended for like 40 games. You know, the NHL is not afraid to suspend people. I think George Paros has been but I also don't think George Paros is going to be in control next year of those decisions, unfortunately for him. But ultimately I think this has been blown way out of proportion by everybody. I think this has been completely blown out of proportion. Anyway, I think it's time that we move on from Tom Wilson. I think it's time for everybody else to move on from Tom Wilson and just let the games happen. If something like this happens again, like in the very near future, then sure, call me out on it and I'll be glad to say, yeah, you know what? I was wrong. But until that happens, let's just let the games be played. Let's see how Tom Wilson plays. Let's see how he reacts. Is he still going to goon it up? Is he going to clean his, clean up his act? Only time will tell. Maybe he takes this as a come to Jesus meeting and just say, you know what? I got really lucky for not getting suspended. I don't want to have that happen again. Maybe it goes the other direction. Maybe he damn near takes somebody's life. We don't know until the games are played. And what happened is, has happened. There's no way of changing it at this point. There's no way to suspend them after the fact, after the ruling has been handed down. So to those that are calling for a banishment or a suspension, there's no sense in doing that anymore. We're well past that. Anyway, we're going to move on from Tom Wilson because I think it's only going to give Tom a little bit more agita, even though there's more agita to come uh, later in this episode. But we're going to move on to some different news. We're going to move on to some happier news right now uh, because we have a brand new team in the NHL, finally, the Seattle Kraken have officially made their last payment necessary to officially become the 32nd team in the NHL. Tom, how hyped are you for the expansion draft this summer? I'm hyped. I'm curious to see what they're going to do. Curious to see, um, will it be Vegas, like where they're able to, you know, bring in a couple stars? We'll, we'll see. We'll see. You know, 
Right now, you have Ron Francis running the show over there. He's proved his worth as a GM before. So we'll see what happens. I'm curious to see who their coach is going to be. But just a lot of good things in Seattle, out of Seattle, you know. And I feel like maybe they should have had a team earlier on. Maybe in the last 20 or so years, they should have been looked at as a city for a potential relocation or expansion. So, you know, good for Seattle. Um, fun fact about Seattle, I'm sure I've mentioned it on the show before. It was the first, they were the first American city to win a Stanley Cup way back when with Seattle Metropolitans over 100 years ago. Which is an awesome fun fact. And question I have for you, Tom, is to tie along with uh, the fact that you made before about who they're going to name as coach. You know, you currently have uh, Gerard Gallant sitting out in coaching free agency at the moment. Do you think Seattle goes back to the you know Vegas well, if you will, and uh, picks up Gerard Gallant as their first coach? It's possible. It's quite possible. Um, with Ron Francis out there, there's rumors that Rod Brent, there's um, not rumors. It's a fact that Rod Brendamore's contract is firing at the end of the year with Carolina too. I could see him reaching out to his old buddy and bringing Rod Brendamore out there. As you've seen, Rod Brendamore works wonders with young and inexperienced teams. It's been done before. You have Rick Tockett out there as a free agent and, you know, uh, a former NHL star on the radio today talking about coaching. Why, why uh, some, some bald guy who lives in New York who used to play for the Rangers, why don't he go out to Seattle and coach? Let that be his first job. Prove it. Prove yourself. <laughs> Fighting words from Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but either way, this is exciting. I'm uh, very excited to see the first Seattle games next year, and I hope you guys are excited too, and we'll be unpacking everything Seattle over the course of the next coming months. Once the Stanley Cup is you know, slowly winding down, we'll have plenty to be talking about in Seattle coming soon. But for now, Seattle is now free to start making some free agent moves and even make some trades right now. So do not be surprised if before the expansion draft, they make a few signings and they might maybe wheel and deal just a little bit before their expansion draft, which is set for July 21st. So mark your calendars there. Now, moving on to our last bit of news, uh, a fond farewell to a particular player here. Uh, goaltender Ryan Miller has announced that he is going to retire at the end of this upcoming season. And what a career for Ryan Miller. Ryan Miller will retire as the winningest goaltender in USA hockey history. He is an Olympic gold medalist and has done wonders over the course of his career, being the winningest U.S.-born goaltender in history. Tom, what are your thoughts on Ryan Miller's career here? Uh, great career. You know, he was unfortunately on the wrong end of that Sidney Crosby cult back in 20, uh, 2010, which I still would have loved if they were, if that U.S. team was able to win gold medal. He would have, he would have had something to, um, uh, you know, something on his resume other than all the wins he had and the great teams he played for. He was a starter on that Buffalo Sabres team that I had brought up a few weeks ago as the greatest team I ever saw to not win a Stanley Cup. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, good on him. Cheers to a great career. I just wish he could have, uh, wish he could have, you know, backstop the team to something, whether it was a Stanley Cup in Buffalo or whether it was that gold medal back in 2010. I just, because he, he really did deserve it. And it's really a shame he didn't get either. So great career, you know, great player. Maybe the, uh, maybe one of the best U.S. goalies ever. I'm not going to say he's the best, but maybe one of the best. But yeah, great career to Ryan Miller, um, you know, and cheers to whatever he's going to try and do next. Who knows? Yeah, I agree. I mean, especially in those Buffalo years, he was a magnificent goaltender and definitely uh, that Buffalo team was the best team to never win the Stanley Cup. Uh, in 2009-2010, if I got that year correct, yeah, 2009-2010, uh, Ryan Miller won the Vezina Trophy. He uh, was also an all-star that year and came in fourth in heart uh, voting that year, which is uh, quite amazing for that uh, year that he had. He is going to end his career as of right now with 403 uh, wins, which, oh wait, sorry, that's game started. My bad. Um, 284 wins, 186 losses, and will also end with a 916 save percentage and a two uh, 2.58 goals against average. Great career. 28 shutouts to also boot with that fantastic career. Ryan Miller, for whatever is next for you, 
We hope you ride off into the sunset. It's a shame you couldn't have gotten that Stanley Cup, but you will still be remembered fondly as one of the better goaltenders of the salary cap era, for sure. And with that said, hey, we mentioned the Stanley Cup before, and last week we had predicted our seeds. So now it's time to go on to some bold playoff predictions. So what we're going to be doing for this prediction this week is we're going to just predict the first two rounds, which... If you remember from the format from last week, the first two rounds of this upcoming playoffs is just the divisional rounds. So at the end of the second round, you'll have one team coming out of each division to be reseeded and face off in the semifinals for the Stanley Cup, which will culminate obviously in the Stanley Cup final. So it's time to unpack that and... Not a lot has changed from last week in terms of our seating. We have some predictions that have kind of gone our way so far, maybe with a couple little changes here and there. But, Tom, we're going to start off here with uh, the East Division. Who do you feel is going to come out of the East Division on top? Unpack your first round and second round. Off you go. Okay, so I'm going by the current standings, and these are the current standings as of last night when I did this. I've just been a crazy day today, so I'm – we didn't get time to update. So I'm going by the standings as of 6 o'clock last night um, on May 4th, 2021. Um, so if we go by the current standings, the first round we will have the Washington Capitals and the Islanders, the New York Islanders. Now, I know the Islanders beat them in the bubble last year, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure here. I think uh, the Capitals do get some revenge. Um, Islanders have been struggling mightily lately, and as I've seen firsthand as a Rangers fan, the Caps have been soaring. Um, this also gives us a, uh, another series and this Islanders capital series, I think it'll go six or seven, but I still think it's the capitals coming out on top. Um, this would also give us a second matchup, which would be the Boston Bruins and the Pittsburgh Penguins, which we've only, we only really saw once in this modern era here. And that was back in 2013 when the Penguins were stacked and the Bruins swept them right out of the playoffs. Um, like I said, with the Islanders and the Caps, this could also go either way. But Boston's top six just have a little more youth in their step, and believe it or not, a little bit more experience too right now. Um, the Bruins also seem to have the Pens numbers of late, um, so I'm going with the Bruins here. But also, also, six or seven games, this is not going to be an easy series. So now we go to the Eastern Division Final, and that would give us the Boston Bruins and the Washington Capitals. And surprise, 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 just like the old division days, this is going seven as well. Maybe we flip a coin. I'm not sure. We got to really see how the Capitals are down the stretch. Obviously, they've had some injuries. They've been resting guys. And maybe they'll be healthy come playoff time. Maybe they won't. We don't know. We don't know how a veteran's going to be. We don't know how Chris Netsoff's going to be. We just don't know. We don't know right now. Are they going to be playing through injuries? Or are they just resting them now for cautionary reasons? If they're not, the Bruins are taking the series. Right now, I will say arguably the Bruins have a better goaltending. And the Bruins have some better depth than their bottom six. So um, uh, I'm going with the Boston Bruins to come out of the Eastern Division. I think that's a very, very bold prediction there. So I'm going to be going with uh, my predictions based on Washington facing Boston in the first round and Pittsburgh facing New York in the first round. So meaning that Washington is facing the number four seed Boston, Pittsburgh in number two is facing the number three seed New York Islanders. So... That makes our predictions a little bit different. I'm just going based on my seeding from last week. But in that first matchup, Washington versus Boston, I agree. I think it is going to go to distance. I think it could go Washington's way in six or seven games. I have it on seven games right now. Boston has really turned it around over the past two weeks. Ever since that Taylor Hall acquisition, I think this is a very different Boston team. What gives me a little bit of pause for concern is dropping some easier games, you know, not for nothing. The, the New Jersey devils should not be beating, you know, a Boston Bruins lineup right now, but devils beat them in overtime last night. Again, the devils have beaten them five times this season. Not what you want to see out of a, you know, a playoff team that is going to go potentially go the distance. Washington, on the other hand, against the devils has won all games against the New Jersey Devils. Not one game that they dropped to them. Washington has resilience. That's the biggest difference between Washington and Boston at the moment. Um, 
The Pittsburgh, New York series, I have Pittsburgh taking it in seven. I think the New York uh, Islanders will take uh, Pittsburgh the distance. I think they're not going to be an easy win. Uh, that being said, I just think that Pittsburgh has the upper hand at the moment just because of their offense. I think Sidney Crosby has a lot to prove. They're getting Evgeny Malkin back as well. That could be a big push uh, for Pittsburgh in the playoffs. That leaves a very fun East final of Washington versus Pittsburgh, which everyone knows what it's all about. It's Ovechkin versus Crosby. And in this one, my money's on Washington. It could go to distance. I have Washington in six in this one. I believe very highly in the Washington Capitals. This could be one of their last times to really compete at the moment. There's talks that they could move on from Evgeny Kuznetsov after this season. They could even expose him to the expansion draft, which would be really interesting if you're Seattle in that place. Um, But I'll be really interested to see what happens there. For now, coming out of the East, I have Washington coming out of the East as your Eastern champions. Now we're going to move on to the Central Division, which, uh, oh boy, this is going to be a lot of fun. The Central Division is going to be the division to watch in the playoffs. I'm calling it right now. Tom, let's start with your predictions. First two rounds, Central Division, go. Okay, well, I'm going off uh, like I did with the East Division. I'm going off with, uh, with going off the predictions of the standings as of 5 o'clock last night. Um, so to start here, our first series, we'll have the Carolina Hurricanes as your number one seed versus the National Predators as your number four seed. Maybe the Preds take a game in this one somewhere along the line, but I'm going with Carolina in five. I'm not going to go any more detail here. It's just Carolina in five, they're just too good. And Nashville's sort of been on an off all year. So that takes us to our number two and our number three seed, which would be the Florida Panthers and Tampa Bay Lightning. And this is the first time ever we will see a battle of the sunshine state in the playoffs. And, well, as we know, Panthers have had a good year and they'll have the home ice, but the Bolts are the defending Stanley Cup champions. And, well, warning everybody because we got the upset special here. Florida's taking this in seven. It's going to be a back-and-forth series. It's going to be it's going to be a seesaw battle. You're never going to know who's in control. And no one will really be in complete control until you hear that buzzer go off in Game 7 or a sudden-death OT goes off, go, all goes off in Game 7. Uh Going for the Panthers in seven here. I think they upset the defending champs. Unfortunately, going into the next round, that'll give us the Carolina Hurricanes and Florida Panthers. And unfortunately, this is where the luck of the Cats from South Florida runs out. Carolina, again, easy five-game series, easy path for them. Carolina's coming out of Central Division. Just right now, I just can't see anybody in that division taking them out. Interesting take. And first, let me just say for the Central Division – Holy crap, these first round matchups. So right now, as you, as it's slated right now, you've got Carolina versus Nashville, which is probably the easiest to uh, to predict. I'm going to call my shot here. Carolina comes out on top in a sweep of Nashville. I'm calling my shot now, even though we're going to learn next week that I really should stop calling my shot. Next week, we're revisiting some predictions, uh, some preseason predictions, that is. Which leaves us for the number two and number three seed, Tampa Bay Lightning versus Florida Panthers. And my goodness, what a first round treat. This is, you know, for me, the matchup to watch. This may come as a surprise. And Tom, I'm actually going to be agreeing with you here. I actually take Florida in this matchup in seven games. This is going to go back and forth, but do not sleep on the Florida Panthers. They are a deep team who made some very similar depth moves that the Tampa Bay Lightning made last year for their Stanley Cup push, acquiring such faces, in Florida's case, as Nikita Gusev and Sam Bennett. Uh, I got to I gotta amend something real quick. I thought the pickup of uh, Carter Verhaeg was a nothing move at the beginning of the season for the Florida Panthers, and my goodness, he proved me wrong, and I'm so glad he did. He has been all the difference for the Florida Panthers this year and has been a fantastic pickup for them. That being said, I'm still going to die on my hill with Radko Gudis. He is not that good a defender. Anyway, besides the point, I also think Florida could go crazy and start Spencer Knight for a few of these games just to give him a taste of the NHL playoffs, especially coming off of uh, how well he did in the World Juniors this past January. And then after that, 
you've got Carolina versus Florida, and I'm going to go the other way with this one. This is a really tough matchup. I love both of these teams, and it could honestly go either way, but only one team can win. I'm going to go with Florida here. I just think the way that Florida has been playing coming into the playoffs is going to be the difference. And ultimately, I think Florida has the edge in between the pipes. I think having a deep number of goaltenders in Sergei Bobrovsky, Chris Drager, and Spencer Knight is going to be the biggest difference maker for them. Now, yes, you can argue for Carolina. Ned has been fantastic in Ned. And so has Peter Morazic and James Reimer when they've been healthy. That's been the thing. If they have a healthy goaltender in net, Carolina will take this. If they're still still hurting at that point, Florida takes this in seven. And Florida would be the ones coming out on top as the Central Division champions and a potentially very scary team to come up against for anybody who's going to come up against them. Next, we're moving on to the Western Division, which, oh boy, Tom and I, Tom and I, I think, have a difference of opinion here, but we'll get into that. Tom, I'm going to let you go first two rounds in the Western Division. Go. Well, we have Vegas and the Blues here. Obviously, St. Louis won, won it all two years ago. They'll get that fourth seed, but that's about as far as they're going. Five games, easy here for Vegas. Move along, nothing to see. Our second round will have the, or rather, second semifinal will have the second seeded Colorado Avalanche versus the Minnesota Wild. And let me tell you, every year you have that one team, that one team that's a prize team, that team that does a, that's that breath of fresh air in the league that you didn't really think was going to do anything, and then boom, there they are. And that team really has been the Minnesota Wild this year with Kirill Kaprizov and Zuccarello and just every good thing that's going on out there in Minnesota. Um. Unfortunately, that smoke screen the Wild created is going to dissipate. Going with Colorado here in five, I, Colorado's just too strong for them. They're just too strong, and I just can't see Minnesota beating them. I, it's, just, it's, it's really, really hard for me to see Minnesota coming out on top in that series. And that gives us a Western Division final of the Vegas Golden Knights and Colorado Avalanche. Maybe the best series we'll see in the second round if it does indeed happen. And say what you will, Vegas was there. Vegas has the experience. Vegas went to that final. Uh, I was going to say two years ago, but I'm dead wrong. It was three years ago. And you know something? A lot of those guys are still there. They've gotten better with Petrangelo in the lineup. But one thing that Colorado is is they're a young and they're an upcoming team. And they went through that mandatory suffering last year against Dallas. They probably should have came out of that series, and they didn't. But I think this year those young kids in Colorado finally learned. They finally learn how to take that next step. They finally learn how to get over that hump. And they do it against the Vegas Golden Knights. And they do it in seven games. They win game seven on the road in Vegas. Colorado Avalanche coming out of the Western Division. Nathan McKinnon, Miko Rantanen, Gabriel Landeskog. Here come the Avs. Well, all really good predictions. And just to start off here, I'm going to be eating some humble pie here, but it does look like the St. Louis Blues are making the playoffs instead of the Arizona Coyotes. Now, I know, shock, I know that the Arizona Coyotes are not making the playoffs. Oh, wow. Anyway, you know, it gets worse for Arizona. We all know it does. But I'm going to predict based on the current, current standings. So the first round, we got Vegas versus St. Louis. Spoiler alert. It was never going to matter who the number four seed was, whether it was Arizona, whether it was St. Louis, because Vegas was always going to sweep this series. I'm riding that Vegas train hard this year, as you're going to find out. Vegas is, the train is on the track, and everybody's in the way. Choo-choo. Next is Colorado and Minnesota, which is actually tougher to predict. You would have never thought coming into this season that Minnesota would be in this position. But to be honest, I always believed in Minnesota from the end of last season when we started our very first episode of I-80 Sports. People might remember, I was a firm believer in Minnesota. And that was even before Kirill the Thrill Kaprizov took over this league. They have had quite a run this year. Thanks to Kirill Kaprizov. You know, thanks to the 
impeccable run at the end of the season by Kevin Fiala, who I mentioned in the very first episode of I-80 NHL as well. Uh, Matt Zuccarello has also contributed very, very well to this team. And unfortunately, they are just facing a monster in Colorado who will unfortunately knock them out in six games. But there's a lot to be excited about right now in Minnesota, and I think it's only going to get started from here. They've got some really good pieces coming up and uh, down the pipeline, especially in Marco Rossi uh, eventually coming down the uh, pipeline for them. All good things in Minnesota uh, coming up. You know, mark my words, Minnesota's going to be back with a vengeance. They're going to steal a few games here. Kirill Kaprasov is going to make his playoff debut and you know maybe even thrill a few games. But unfortunately, Colorado is going to come out on top. That leaves us with Vegas versus Colorado, much like Tom's prediction here. But sorry, Tom, I'm going with Vegas here. And I'll tell you why. Colorado has failed to do one thing this year. Get a proper 1B for Philip Grubauer. Sure, you could argue. Oh, but they got Devin Dubnik. No, he's not even a proper 1B for Grubauer. He's a backup or third goaltender on any team right now in the NHL. And it's going to come back to haunt them this year when, honestly, they should be the unanimous favorite for the Stanley Cup. But here we are. Vegas has a complete team, including the best goalie tandem in the NHL and also a goaltender who I predict is going to end up being the Vezina winner at the end of this year in Marc-Andre Fleury, a career renaissance for Marc-Andre Fleury, mind you. I predict Vegas in six here, and it hurts me to say that because, like I said, Colorado should have been so much more this year, and I think they are a fantastic team. Unfortunately, Vegas is going to do them in. That leaves us now with the Canadian division. And, oh boy, I hope we get this first round uh, matchup here because, wow, this would be amazing if we get to see this. But, Tom, I'm going to let you go first. So, two rounds, Canadian division, last division preview. Go for it. Okay, like I said, going off the standings as of 5 p.m. yesterday, our first semifinal will consist of maybe the biggest – and the most classic rivalry in hockey. We will have the number one seeded Toronto Maple Leafs versus the number four seeded Montreal Canadiens. For the first time since 1979, they'll be meeting in the playoffs. And coincidentally, and not so much for 1979, because the three times they met in the 70s, we all have sweeps. But the Toronto Maple Leafs now have a have three 54-year curses here. It's been 54 years since they won the Stanley Cup. It's been 54 years since they beat the Montreal Canadiens in a playoff game. It's been 54 years since they beat the Montreal Canadiens in a playoff series. All happened in that 1967 Stanley Cup final. Well, at least two of those are going to end right here. Um, the Leafs will stress their fans out a little bit in this series because there will be time for Mo- – you'll think Montreal is back in it. The Habs will have some hope, and the Habs fans will be, you know, be getting in the Leafs' faces about their drought and about how much better they are. But the Leafs are taking this series in six games. The Leafs just have too many weapons for the Habs to take them out. I'm excited for this one. We haven't seen this since the 70s, and it really hasn't been like high-quality hockey since the 60s. Because remember in the 70s, the Habs were a juggernaut. They were a dynasty. They had Guy Lafleur, Ken Dryden, Larry Robinson, Jacques Lemaire, Steve Shutt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Leafs had some good players too. They had guys like Daryl Sittler and Lanny McDonald and Tiger Williams. But the Leafs had – one of the most miserable people to ever walk the earth, and Harold Ballard is their owner, and he refused to spend any money on the team and then would trade players away to undermine Daryl Sittler, or Daryl Sittler would speak out against it and be like, oh, well, you know, you can't talk talk about me like that on the owner, and blah, 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 blah. The 1970s Toronto Maple Leafs were a dumpster fire when they still could have been a contender. But regardless, Leafs and six in this one. Um, this takes us to another sort of classic Canadian rivalry here. An old Smythe Division matchup from the 80s. Wayne Gretzky versus Dale Howard, Chuck, back in the day. We'll have the number two Edmonton, number two seed Edmonton Oilers versus the number three seed Winnipeg Jets. Oilers got a ton to be happy about this year. I'd be happy as hell, too, if I had the best hockey player in the world on my team. Um, but until they can show they until they can show they can win in the playoffs, until they can show they can have better depth than their opponents, and until they can show that they can roll their sleeves up and, you know, 
maybe not, I'm not going to say gritty physical hockey, but just play that defensive playoff hockey. I'm not buying what they're selling. Connor McDavid's going to dazzle. Leon Dreisaitl's going to dazzle. They're going to have a good series. Don't get me wrong, but they're not going to come out on top. They're just not. They're not going to come out on top. I'm going with the Winnipeg Jets in five here. And the Jets will jet their way into the second round before those Jets run out of fuel because the Toronto Maple Leafs will be waiting there for them. And, well, break out the brooms, Leafs fans, because you're going through Winnipeg in four. Series won't even be close. Leafs in four. Leafs coming out of Canadian division. Good predictions there. And one thing that we should mention with the Canadian division is because of Vancouver's uh, long COVID break, uh, the Canadian division is actually going to wrap up on May 18th. But fortunately, based on the standings that we currently have, we can probably predict the first two rounds based on those current standings, as you just heard from Tom. Uh, so we have a very exciting first round matchup in Toronto versus Montreal. I'm hyped for this matchup. We haven't seen this matchup in a very long time. This is an original six matchup uh, that could normally never happen in a first round. But unfortunately, unlike the 70s and 80s, Montreal doesn't hold a candle to Toronto. It's a role reversal here. It's going to be Toronto in five. And it's unfortunate that it's not going to be closer. Toronto just has a much better team than Montreal. I think Toronto is far deeper than Montreal is currently. And I think Montreal is still building towards that next step. Uh, next is Winnipeg versus Edmonton. And it's a pretty interesting matchup and a pretty even overall matchup, to be honest. In the end, I'm actually going to go out on a limb and say Edmonton in seven. Ultimately, Connor Hellebuck is going to be the one that's really going to be keeping Winnipeg alive in this one. The problem is Winnipeg's hurt. Winnipeg's always been hurt. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say again, Winnipeg is going to have injury issues in the playoffs again, and I want them to prove me wrong. But at some point, Mark Scheifele is going to go down with some kind of injury. You are already missing Nikolai Ehlers for the remainder of this season. This is not good for Winnipeg limping into the playoffs like this. Limping not meaning like they're the fourth seed, but limping in the sense that like this is a team that's playing hurt right now. So I do have an ulterior motive for having Edmonton move on because – we would finally get a matchup hockey fans have been waiting for for a long time. And that is Toronto versus Edmonton. Austin Matthews versus Connor McDavid. The unfortunate thing is it'll be very anticlimactic because Toronto in five, because of course Toronto is going to be coming out of the Canadian division. I hate to be jumping on that bandwagon of Toronto fans because like Toronto fans bug the unholy you know what out of me, but Toronto's coming out of the Canadian division. I don't see any other team coming out of this Canadian division right now. So hopefully you guys agree or even disagree with our predictions there. And we want to hear from you guys down below. So make sure that you're active in the conversation down below, but whew, we still got more to go in our episode because as you guys well know, even though I'm wearing a capital Jersey tonight, just because I'm a massive heel, I am a diehard devils fan to my detriment. And who boy, Tom is a diehard Rangers fan, much to his detriment at this point. And I know originally about a day or two ago, Tom didn't have as much to unpack, but oh, man, we should have just done the episode like yesterday or Monday because now he's got a lot more to unpack. And unfortunately, I think, uh, Tom, this is going to be your therapy session here. Tom, it is time for your Rangers realm. You have the floor, sir. I relinquish my time to you. Well, what I had wanted to get on was about a week ago, you know, had they been able to win those two games against the Islanders, they'd have been a point out of the playoffs, you know. And I was saying all the time, you know, if they don't make the playoffs this year, no problem. A lot to look forward to, you know, from the top down, just a good organization, you know. And that that just ended today. Like that. Snap of the fingers. You lost two games to the Islanders. You know, you didn't play well. So be it. You lost. You know, the BS Capitals Monday night, you know, things like that happen. But as I had mentioned above, or before rather, Panarin was hurt. He was playing hurt. Anybody who couldn't see that, I'm sorry. But, you know, I, I you could see it straight out when you watched him play. He was playing hurt. They're, they kept him out for precautionary reasons. The unfortunate part about it was is when you have an idiotic owner like James Dolan who doesn't know what he's doing and doesn't seem – seems to want to – uh Flex his muscle and his authority when, in reality, he shouldn't. He went and did that today. 
I, I'm, I'm perplexed right now with these firings. JD was the president, yes. And I don't really know what he really did here, if anything. Um, I didn't want JD here back in oh back in 09, back in 19, rather. I wanted Jeff Gordon to have full control of this team. I really did. Well, now JD doesn't have full control of this team, and Jeff Gordon doesn't have full control of this team because they're both no longer involved with the New York Rangers. Chris Drury was named GM and president today, which makes me, I guess, sort of happy. I don't know what kind of exact Drury is. I guess there's been no complaints, and a lot of teams were after him. So I'm curious to see how he's going to be now in this new role. But I just don't understand. I don't understand what the onus was for firing Gordon and JD. It doesn't make sense. Okay, the team wasn't physical enough. So you couldn't give them until the offseason to do it? You lost two games to the Islanders. Okay, so what? You lost two games to the rebuilding team. You lost two games. So be it. So be it. It's a rebuilding team, one of the youngest teams in the league. What are you firing them for? What are you firing them for? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you fire them for this? And I think it comes back to that little statement they released yesterday. Dolan released that statement wanting Paros' head and wanting his job gone. And there were rumors that, first of all, Gordon and JD didn't even know about it. And then when the statement came out, they were distancing themselves from it. Other rumors I had heard besides that one, because it had nothing to do with that, were Dolan had approached JD after the after the second Wolves to the Islanders and said, I want Jeff Gordon out of here. JD had said to Dolan, I'm not firing him. If you want to fire him, go ahead. I'm not doing it. I think that upset Dolan. And he said, fine, you, know, you don't want to do what I tell you. You're both fired. Now you have people out there saying, oh, well, Gordon, well, Drury's just a figurehead. He's only there for the interim, and they're going to bring Mark Messier back to run the team. What is this obsession with Mark Messier? Somebody want to explain it to me? The guy won a cup here for us in 1994. He ended the 54-year curse. was a big part of it. Hat trick against it. I'm not going to tell the story because everybody out there knows the story already. I'm not going to rehash something that's played on MSG 79 times a day in the summertime which is embarrassing enough in itself. The guy has never managed a team. He's never coached. He was a special assistant to Glenn Sather uh, for a few years. Yeah, but, but what, what did he really do? What did he really do? I don't want Mark Messier within 10 feet of this freaking team. He will destroy it. And then he goes on the radio before a transition team said, oh, you got to learn how to play in the alley. It's funny. Yeah, Mark Messier was that kind of player. But, but 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 answer me this one. Answer me this one, and I want to know from everybody out there. You got an issue with it? Please take it up with me personally. When were those Edmonton Oilers teams in the '80s big, gritty, hitting teams? Because to me, Messi was a gritty hitting. But when did they win games by hitting people and by playing gritty? Last I checked, they skated circles around everybody to win their Stanley Cups. So all of a sudden, Mark Messi is preaching tough, gritty hockey. It's funny because in 1992, when Roger Nielsen wanted to play like that, Mark Messier wanted him fired because he wanted the team to play a fast puck pursuit, you know, rocket hockey style. Mark Messier needs to stay away from this team. James Dolan needs to stay at it. needs to stay out of the team's affairs. What's done is done. Gorton is gone. JD is gone. Gorton was building this team into something that was going to be really, really good. I can only hope Drury keeps doing what he's doing. I really, really hope that they're not going to go into full-out old-school Ranger mode and trade this guy for Eichel and trade that guy for a tough guy. And all of a sudden, we're seeing guys like Vitaly Kravtsov and Capo Caco and maybe even Alexi Lafreniere playing in different cities in a few years because they decided to go after a wily veteran or a tough guy to, to maybe or maybe not win a Stanley Cup, to do what they did in 94. That 94 Cup, as great as it was, screwed that organization up for years. And I think Gorton and JD were there to ultimately – Try and hope that that didn't happen again and try and build a team that was going to win multiple cups and was going to be a contender for 10 to 15 years. Now I sit there after today and after what happened today and with Dolan saying that, oh, well, you know, the rebuild was taking too long and I didn't want to wait. Somebody, I didn't want to wait 10 years as a quote that you said. Where did anybody say this was going to take 10 years? Okay, we're in the third year of it. They're sniffing the playoffs. Okay, if it was next year or the year after, maybe, maybe, maybe you make a move then. But you make a move when you're the youngest team in the league in the toughest division in the league with four veteran teams above you who have been there before? I'm sorry. This is wrong in every way. This call for toughness is wrong. Okay, bring in some guys over the summer. But don't, don't, 
don't gut you don't gut the people who are trying to build this team back in respectability. You know what? I always said the future is bright every week. I said the future is bright. We got this guy, we got that guy, we got this guy, we got that guy. And yeah, we still have all these kids. They're all still here. But I don't know if they'll be here come October. I don't know if they'll make a stupid move in the offseason over summer. I really don't know. I really, really hope that Chris Drury is left alone. I hope Glenn Sather isn't brought back aboard to do this. I hope that Mark Messier isn't brought in to make decisions or help Drury out. I hope that John Tortorella isn't brought back to be the head coach because he's ready. Honestly, at this point, I take David Quinn over Tortorella. We don't even know if Quinn's going to stay. This may be Quinn's swan song tonight in the last two games against the Bruins. I don't know. But after saying how proud I was of this organization and how happy I was and how looking forward to the future I was over these last three years and these last months and these last weeks, now I sit here and it's a big question mark. This whole thing now is a huge, huge question mark. Now I don't know where this team is going, and now I don't know what they're going to do. Thanks a lot, Dolan. Thanks a lot, bud. Yeah, it's a lot to unpack for – Rangers fans out there. It's a lot to unpack over the aftermath of these past 48 hours in general. And I'm of the opinion that honestly, Gordon was one of the driving forces for this Rangers team. And, you know, I thought Rangers management was among the best in the entire NHL. I might be a devil's fan, but I am not biased enough to say what the Rangers have been building has been special. And there's a lot of doubt that's now being cast uh, over the coming months, uh, over rather the months to come. So we'll see what happens. It's really going to be interesting to see what happens from here. But we're going to move on from the Rangers for now. We're going to move on to my Devil's Den as per usual, which... Uh, Pretty good week by the Devils. This was a good week to evaluate who uh, Lindy Ruff uh, will be relying on next year. Based on this week, I think it is safe to say that the Devils will want to hold on to Igor Sharangovich. Uh, he's a player that is developing into a Swiss Army knife of sorts. He can play well on the second line or the third line. He plays well on the penalty kill, and he's even contributed in overtime and on the power play. He's a player that I think Lindy Ruff will be relying on very much next year. And it will be a player that could even get protected from Seattle from expansion draft. Another surprise over the past week or so has been defenseman Connor Carrick. I was sure his season was done in February when I thought he was perma benched and banished to Binghamton forever. But since the trade deadline, he has found some minutes and he's capitalized on every single minute. He's been a puck magnet, blocking everything that comes near him. He has one of the best blocking ratios on the Devils currently. He's been very good with puck possession as well. And he's even shown some grit. He stood up and has fought two times already. He could be a candidate for expansion uh, and could be a candidate for Seattle to take for the expansion draft. He could also be a reliable seventh defenseman for the Devils next year. I'll go more in depth on my final thoughts on the devil season next week, but I really like how this team is finishing. This team has the potential of being something very special. And I see great things in this team's future. I think things are only beginning. And with another high draft pick this year, I think this could be a moment for the devils to really kind of capitalize on things and to really, you know, build this team, you know, outward from here. Uh, one thing I did want to mention real quick, and this is kind of going off of, you know, outside of what I wanted to talk about beforehand, but I got to say, I was a little bit irritated uh, this week when I read ESPN's take on what the devils need to do this off season uh, in terms of what they need to do to make this team better. And they blame the goaltending this year, which sure. I don't blame them necessarily for that. They've had a cast and crew behind the net. But one of the one of their blames was Mackenzie Blackwood, which I feel is not appropriate. Mackenzie Blackwood is part of the New Jersey Devils future. Anybody who's a Devils fan knows the potential that Mackenzie Blackwood shows as a potential elite goaltender in this league. So I'm hoping that ESPN you know kind of cleans up their act 
in analysis in the next uh, couple weeks, couple months, you know, especially before they really take over with, you know, broadcasting the NHL full time. So we'll see. I mean, I really like how the Devils are ending. I'll give you my full recap on the season next week and we'll go from there. Now we're going to move on quickly to some general NHL, you know, U.S. hockey weekly thoughts as we normally do. Tom, what's something that stuck out to you this week? And why was it Connor McDavid? <laughs> you know something? As much as I trash him and the Oilers above, um, he's on pace. If it were a normal 82-game season, he would, have been, he would have been on pace for 150 points. To put that in perspective, that would be the second largest point total since Mario Lemieux in 95-96. And he dominated that year, Lemieux. Believe me, we did. I think we got a really special player here, McDavid. I do. I was talking to somebody about him the other day. You know, I know, like I've doubted him before and whatnot, but there's just I, I watch him play sometimes when I come home late at night after playing and I pop the Oilers on. The guy is just he's dominant, and I think he's a better player. At the end of the day, he'll be a better player than Crosby and Ovechkin are or were when they retire. When McDavid retires, I think he'll be he'll go down as a player with higher numbers than them. I guess the unfortunate part about it with McDavid is that the management up in Edmonton is a little foolish, and it is a shame that he may retire with one Stanley Cup or no Stanley Cups unless they get it together up there. And a guy who's that good doesn't deserve it. But, you know, cheers to McDavid. We haven't seen a player like this in a long, long, long time. Yeah. Cheers to Connor McDavid, especially, you know, 90 points in 50 games played. That is absurd. You know, 30 goals, 90 points. Well done, sir. Well, well, well done. Uh, my highlight from this past week uh, is actually going on to the goaltending side of things, as I've kind of been doing the past uh, couple of weeks. Not on purpose, but it's just, it just kind of happened. Mark andre Fleury tied uh, Roberto Luongo for number three on the all-time wins list, uh, which stands at 489 wins. Uh, and he's having quite a career renaissance, as I alluded to before in my uh, predictions. And I would not be surprised if he wins the Vezina this year. He has been fantastic this year. And I it could not happen to a better guy in the NHL. Uh, Marc-Andre Fleury, a lot of people cast their doubts of him being a starting goaltender in this league coming into this season. That He probably lost his job to Robin later. And he took that job back by force in Vegas and he is one of the big reasons why I do believe in Vegas for this upcoming playoffs much to Tom chagrin but still <laughs> anyway moving on it's time to wrap this up with our question of the week which our question of the week is what matchup are you most excited for in the first round of the playoffs Tom I'll start with you what are you most excited to see in the first round it's all history man it's all history Leafs and Habs, Hockey Night in Canada, Saturday night, man. I'm going to be glued to that every time they play. I'll, what I try to do is when the Rangers don't make it, I try like the first round and just watch another division series just so I don't have to see the teams that I see more often than not during the season and teams that I may not like for whatever reason that may have, you know, upset me. So I always try to go into like a different division and watch two teams I don't have an opinion on just duke it out. And I mean, come on, just doesn't get better than that. Leafs and Habs, first time since 79, and first meaningful one, meaningful one since maybe 1967. Yeah, I got to agree. That is a really, really good series to watch. My series to watch in the first round is actually going to be the Battle of the Sunshine State. It's going to be uh, the Florida versus Tampa Bay matchup to me. That is going to be the series to watch. I'm just excited because that is going to be an explosive series of talent you know watching the likes of alexander barkov jo uh, jonathan huberto against uh steven stamkos Braden point maybe even a returning nikita kucherov who knows there's a lot to unpack with that and we're going to be giving you all the hits with this over the coming weeks you got to make sure you stick with us over the coming weeks as we unpack the stanley cup playoffs as it unfolds and how are you going to do that well you can check us out at iadsports.com for all of the coverage in the NHL and other sports as well. If you love the NFL, if you love college football, if you love soccer in the MLS, make sure you check us out there. Beyond that, you can also check out our reactions on 
our Twitter page at I80 underscore sports NHL. The road to 1000 is on and it's not too late to hop on. Please make sure you hop on. And for those that have already hopped on, thank you so much. We love your support. And that just about does it here for a bonkers episode of I80 sports NHL. And not much else to say. I'm Brian. He's Tom. This has been NHL on IED Sports.